Coming up on Chopper's Politics. Making unpopular decisions uh, that you know are correct. Uh, and you've also got to have a bit of a, a thick skin. So I think all those things in refereeing are also very appropriate to, to being a political leader, particularly here in Scotland. I'm Christopher Out, the Telegraph's chief political correspondent. Chopper to my friends, and this is Chopper's Politics. Well, it's a long way to Scotland from Downing Street, and that's where Boris Johnson, his fiancée Carrie Simons, and their newborn baby Wilfred are heading this weekend, as the PM starts his summer holiday, a staycation in Scotland. But all is not well in the centuries-old union between Scotland and England, with the majority of Scots, according to a recent poll, now wanting out. An interesting time, then, to take out the post of a Scottish Conservative leader. And my guest today is the politician who's done just that, Douglas Ross will be telling me why he's the man who can save the Union from the destructive plans of Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP leader. After all, it's a seven-hour ride between London and Edinburgh, and you never know, the PM could even be listening. About our guest then, Douglas Gordon Ross has been leader of the Scottish Conservative Party since last week. He served as an MP for Morrie since 2017 and was previously a member of the Scottish Parliament for the Highlands and Islands region from 2016 to 2017. And you might also have spotted him running the line at some big football games in Scotland because he's also an elite referee. Douglas Ross, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Can a Tory ever run Scotland again? Oh, well, I think so. I'm absolutely in this to win this. I think any leader of any political party should aspire to get to the very top because you have the belief in your policies and your team to take things forward. And I think uh, we are the only alternative to the SNP uh, in Scotland. We showed that at the 2016 election uh, and the team I'm building and the policies we're going to take forward are, I know, going to reflect what Scotland wants, which is a move away from the division of the past and the constitutional arguments we've had over the last six years since the referendum in 2014 to focusing on the domestic agenda, on education, on health, on the economy, on justice, because for too long I think the SNP have got off with their poor record on these issues because they'd rather pick fights with Westminster and have arguments about a referendum that was, we were told, once in a generation event just six years ago. And if you look in the mirror, do you see a first minister looking back? If I look in the mirror, do I see myself as a First Minister looking back? Yes, as as I said, you've got to aspire to the very top level. And I think Scotland has been let down by 13 years of uh, SNP administration in this country. They have failed young people. They failed young families. They failed aspirational Scots who want to move on. They failed to prepare the country to rebuild from the coronavirus pandemic in terms of an economic recovery. And it's constantly outlining that Nicola Sturgeon, you know, no one can underestimate her uh, great abilities and her uh, presentational skills. Uh, However, beneath the surface, there are major feelings going on day in, day out in every part of Scotland. uh, And that is the nature of devolution, that a large number of areas where people are unhappy are actually fully devolved, nothing to do with Westminster, despite the SNP always trying to pick fights with the UK government and the Westminster Parliament. These are issues that are completely and 100% in the control of the SNP Scottish government government and have been since 2007 for the last 13 years. And if the SNP were to get a majority at the next election, by the end of the next parliament, they would have been in power for almost two decades. And I think people will look at that and say, actually, there is an alternative. There's a strong alternative with a positive vision for Scotland. And maybe it's time for someone else uh, to have the opportunity to take forward their policies to improve the lives of everyone across the country. Isn't your problem, though, that the independent vote is their vote? It's baked in as around 40% or 45 or even more than 50% if you look at recent polls. And the union vote is always going to be split between the, the Labour Party, the Lib Dems and the Tories. So you'll always be fighting for a, really to keep the, the SNP as the largest party without majority. And that's the best you can hope for. Well, that is a problem. The uh, the pro-union United Kingdom vote is split more than the pro-independence and the parties that want to separate Scotland from the rest of the UK. But what I would say to people across the country is there is only one pro-union party that can defeat the SNP, that can take the challenge to Nicola Sturgeon, and that's the Scottish Conservatives. We showed at the last election in 2016, many people forget this, but Nicola Sturgeon went into the 2016 election here in Scotland with a majority. She came out of that election having lost her majority 
majority and she lost it because the Scottish Conservatives increased the number of MSPs to 31. So to Labour supporters, Liberal Democrat supporters or people of no party political persuasion uh, at all, but they want to remain a strong integral part of the United Kingdom and Scotland to have uh, a leading role in that, they should only vote Scottish Conservative because that is the only alternative. Would you consider it a pact with Labour, say? I mean, it might sound extraordinary down in, in London, but in Scotland, if the, if the fate of the union is at stake from another majority SNP government, perhaps a pact is what you should be doing. I just think it's so clear now that, that Labour have completely lost their way. They've got one MP in Scotland. Their uh, MSP group went from being the main opposition to now the third place party in Scotland. Their leader, Richard Leonard, is polling extremely poorly. I think even the strongest of Labour supporters here in Scotland now see that they their party is finished for a generation in this country. And we've seen in my own election here in Murray, people could see I was the only one that could take on the SNP and I got support from Labour supporters, from Liberal Democrat supporters, because they could see I could beat the SNP. I've now done it twice here locally and I'm determined to do that at a national level. You, you, said, you said Richard Dunn is, is polling poorly. Isn't he polling at the same level as you at the moment? Uh, well, I think the poll was taken two days after I was announced <laughs> as leader of the Scottish Conservatives. He's been in place now for several years. So if he's polling in the same uh, level as, as the new boy two days in, then that's a serious <laughs> concern for, for Richard Leonard and Scottish Labour. Would you look at a name change? It's been mooted before, hasn't it? You're the, the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Why not change the name to Unionist and accept that the SNP is a nationalist you'll be the Unionist Party. Why not drop the Conservative name? Sorry, I thought when you, you were suggesting a name change, you wanted me to change my name to, to get my approval <laughs> ratings up a wee bit. I've, I've not reached that drastic level yet, but you never know uh, how the opinion be a moment. Goes go. It would be, it would be. Uh, no, I mean, I think everyone knows the Scottish Conservatives are the strongest Unionist Party. I, I don't think it's names we should be looking at. It's what we're taking forward. And what I want people to see is in me, a leader of the Scottish Conservatives who will work with the UK government, where I think it's in the best interests of Scotland uh, and stand up to the UK government if I think uh, they're wrong, and to uh, get a better deal for people across Scotland through the Scottish Government, because there is so much opportunity, and we've wasted that opportunity through years of division. And I think going forward, we have to look more at the positive outlook rather than names. But in terms, you phrased it as uh, unionists v nationalists. I, I, you know, I've mentioned in, the, in some of the columns I've done, I want to move away from this talk of, of nationalism to, to patriotism, because I can be a proud Scot and a proud Brit, but that doesn't mean I'm a nationalist. And I think I'm, um, you know, I've got such a patriotic feel about this country and, and improving Scotland. And that's what I want to be more patriotic than nationalist. I guess that, that's the heart of the fight you, you'll be fighting in the next nine months, isn't it? It's which union do you want, UK or EU? I mean, are you a proud Scot and a proud European or a proud Scot and a proud Brit? I suppose is the question you might be putting to, to, to Scot. Well, I'm absolutely a proud Scot and a proud Brit. And while Scotland, 62% of Scotland, voted to remain in the European Union, it, many have accepted that the argument was fought in 2016. The referendum was held on a UK-wide franchise and we are now leaving the European Union. At the end of the transition period, it, we will have left. And it seems very strange to people, particularly in, in my constituency, was Murray was the closest part of Scotland to vote between leave and remain. Just 122 votes separated the two campaigns. And many people now question, why are the SNP so adverse to powers in Westminster, where we have 59 Scottish MPs, but they would be more than happy to hand over all these powers uh, to the European Union with unelected bureaucrats? Yes, yeah, so, and that, of course, is the heart of the debate, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, if you can demonstrate the import of a UK union rather than an EU one and make it look as though you know, it does allow Scotland to punch above its weight in the same way that we, we were told the EU allowed us to, but some disagreed. Absolutely. And I, I think there is a really positive message around that, about how we can, as a United Kingdom, um, you know, really deliver deals and trade deals and uh, investment around the globe because we are this strong country together as four nations, rather than having powers in Europe that we have very little say over. You've agreed to be a double act with uh, Ruth Davidson, who is still an MSP. And because you're not, you can't take on the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon at First Minister's Question Time each week. Do you worry she might outshine you? 
Well, uh, Ruth could outshine a lot of people, but she's very clear that her role is to take on Nicola Sturgeon over the next few months while I seek election to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, Ruth is obviously, as you know, leaving the Scottish Parliament, so she has no aspirations to you know, lead the party in any other role than at First Minister's Question Time when she'll be taking on Nicola Sturgeon. And just for your listeners, I'm, I'm sure you'll know, uh, but there is you know, a well-treaded path uh, in this scenario because Alex Salmond, when he became leader, of the SNP was also an MP at Westminster and uh, his uh, stand-in at First Minister's Questions at that time was one Nicola Sturgeon. So no, Alex I forgot that, of and, course. And Nicola Sturgeon uh, have previously done exactly what myself and Ruth Davidson are doing. So you've got the answer ready for when she starts uh, asking where Douglas is at the first FMQs. I, I, I've got that answer ready, but I'm sure it won't <laughs> stop Nicola Sturgeon or the SNP asking it. What will you do if the SNP go ahead, as they probably will do, and try and organise their own poll if they win a majority in May. I mean, I just think it is so deeply damaging for our country. Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond, the then First Minister and Deputy First Minister of Scotland, signed the Edinburgh Agreement with the UK government to say they would respect the result of the referendum. They said it was a gold standard referendum. Everything that had been put in place was done and they would accept the result, win or lose. They then put in their own white paper, their prospectus to the people of Scotland, that this was a once in a generation event. There was only one opportunity to vote for or against separation. And in the end, uh, as soon as the result was held, they decided to uh, change that promise and have continually since then promoted the case for separation, despite the people of Scotland comprehensively voting against it in 2014. So I would say to Nicola Sturgeon and I'd say to the SNP, you've lost that battle. Let's look at your priorities here in Scotland, what you can do with the you know, amazing number of powers the Scottish Parliament has. So it shouldn't be about seeking uh, ever greater powers, but let's use the ones you've got. They are the Scottish government at the moment. They are not just the government for separatists. They are not just the government for nationalists in Scotland. They are supposed to be the government for the whole of Scotland. And at the moment, they seem absolutely focused on picking uh, party political fights, on looking simply at the constitutional argument rather than looking at their own record. Do you think in any sense the SNP have been using this pandemic to try and push forward their left of centre policies, let the state get fully involved in people's lives in a way that's not happening in England, where the government is saying, here's the guidance, you know, try and follow it. Whereas in Scotland, it seems much more, much more interfering from the state. Is that how you see it? Well, I think across the UK, we, we've seen you know considerable restrictions put on people's everyday lives. And I think the way the whole country responded to the early stages of the pandemic ensured that our NHS had the capacity to deal with the issues that they faced. You know, we didn't have the scenes that we saw in Italy and Spain with hospitals overrun. And, and that was because it, governments in every part of the United Kingdom took tough decisions. But the response from the public here in Scotland, in England, in Wales and Northern Ireland was was to back the government. What I think we're now seeing is a more cautious approach. There's no doubt about that uh, here in Scotland, but that brings with it uh, serious questions. Uh, I mean, there is the case that gyms have been open in the rest of the United Kingdom, certainly in England, for some time, uh, yet it's going to be the middle of September at the earliest before they can open in Scotland. And, and if the Scottish Government, if Nicola Sturgeon is saying this is in the best interests of people in Scotland for pubs to be open but gyms to be closed, she has to explain why and why at the moment we can safely reopen gyms. And I'm just using this as one example in England. And I've got businesses here in Scotland and, you know, Duncan Bannatyne has been very clear. They are ready to also reopen in Scotland in a safe, considered way, but that's not allowed. And I think people just question why. If there is the science behind that, if it is a, a health issue, then just explain the science because that doesn't seem to be replicated in other parts of the country. Well, I started my career in, in Scotland on the Scotsman and the Herald and Business AM covering businesses in Scotland. And it always struck me then how most companies were desperate for the union to carry on because they, they don't want a hard border with England because a lot of the companies in Scotland trade south of the border. Why do you think businesses are so are they scared maybe or don't want to come out in favour of the union? Well, I, I think, unfortunately, what we see in Scotland, again, going back to that 40% figure that, that votes SNP and, and votes for independence regularly and, and are so focused on that uh, separation argument. When 
a leading UK politician, for example, the Prime Minister came up to Murray at my seat here a few weeks ago and visited Baxter's Food Group. Now, Baxter's is a huge success story, going back to Gordon and Nina Baxter, carried on by uh, Audrey Baxter, a huge employer in our area and exporting, you know, quality produce around the globe. Yet, when the Prime Minister chooses to visit a successful business like that, to learn more about it, to engage with the business community here in Scotland, they then get boycotted by nationalist supporters because they shouldn't have allowed the Prime Minister of the UK to visit the factory near Fockabers. And that's why I can understand why, sadly, some businesses shy away from that because of the reaction you get from some nationalists. But actually, I think it is now starting to embolden people to say, well, I'm not going to be shouted down. You can't just criticise my business because of who I choose to, to invite to see what we're doing. And, and specifically on a, a policy point, if I can, the UK government's paper, the white paper on the internal market is crucial for Scottish businesses. So we can continue to uh, trade freely across the whole of the UK. But the SNP are against that, not for any good reason, but for simply political reasons. And their political opposition to the internal market uh, legislation that the UK government will take through risks 545,000 jobs in Scotland because it is simply on a political point and it threatens businesses, their employees and the wider economy in Scotland. And I think that is a narrow-minded approach that the SNP have to ditch straight away. And we'll see that those numbers being tested over the next nine months ahead of the election. Do you think the SNP tolerates anti-English sentiment or racism towards English people? I think what we've seen with the displays at the border and the appalling scenes where uh, signs use vulgar language and inflammatory language to tell English people to turn away is completely unacceptable. And what I would have expected from the First Minister of Scotland would have been immediate condemnation of that, rather than waiting several days to be asked a question about it in one of her daily press conferences. You know, the, the go home, the English signs, if that had been again... It is an absolutely racist comment. You simply cannot say that. And as I say, the, the uh, eventually Nicola Sturgeon did make a comment on it, but why didn't she come straight out? I remember that weekend she was tweeting about a book she was reading, but she couldn't give uh, a view as First Minister of Scotland, as leader of the Scottish National Party uh, on uh, signs that were uh, so appalling. And also that was a time we were trying to get our tourism industry back up and running here in Scotland after the restrictions. And the, the Scottish Tourism Alliance was saying themselves, 70% of the trade they rely on here in Scotland is from customers across the rest of the UK. Yet some idiots, and they are absolute vile idiots, were standing at the border with these uh, placards and signs turning people away. It's unacceptable. Right, let's pause there. In a moment, I'll be back with Douglas Ross, the Scottish Tory leader, asking him what he thought of Operation Arse, whether he supports Rangers or Celtic, and the worst piece of abuse he's ever had on the touchline at Old Firm Derby. Right after this. We're interrupting this podcast to bring you news of another Telegraph show we think you might like. It's called Planet Normal. And it's hosted by me, Liam Halligan. And me, Alison Pearson. We're both Telegraph columnists who share the view that far too often those who shout the loudest on the telly just don't represent the views of normal people. So take a trip with us to Planet Normal. We're joined by some stellar guests, well-known voices from politics, business and the arts. All from different fields, but they have one thing in common. They're at the top of their game, but distinctly down to earth. The good news is I finally learned what a podcast is and even how you subscribe to it. It's actually quite simple. Search for Planet Normal on your podcast app or click on the link in the show notes for this episode. You don't really know what a podcast is, do you? I am one. Look, I am one. Who needs to know what it is? I am one. Okay, shut up. <laughs> Douglas Ross, you wrote in an article in last Sunday's Telegraph, which we will link to in the description notes of this episode, why the Tories have been too complacent about the union. What do you mean by that? Well, I, th I think many people now looking at the increasing support in opinion polls for separating Scotland from the rest of the UK would accept that 
when we had that referendum in 2014, many of us on the pro-UK side thought that was it. It was done. We had made uh, the arguments in a, a very stressful and heated campaign and it came down to the vote in September 2014 uh, and 55% of Scotland voted to stay in the rest of the United Kingdom. And as I said earlier, that was uh, on a, a promise that it would be a once in a generation event. What we perhaps didn't uh, fully understand and expect was pretty much the, the very next day that uh, people who support separating Scotland and, and the SNP would continue their arguments, even though uh, they had promised that we wouldn't have this constitutional battle uh, going on beyond September 2014. So I think uh, we just rested on our laurels too much. And it's up to us now to uh, continue to make the positive case for the union in the same way that the people who support separation have never stopped making their case for taking Scotland out of the United Kingdom. Yes, I suppose like with Brexit, I suppose there was there was a remain a backlash, but then that ran out of steam when it became clear that Boris Johnson had won his, his manifesto again in 2019 and Brexit will happen. But you you lack any kind of closure. I mean, even if you win Indy Ref 2, were it to happen, that wouldn't be the end of the fight, would it? As, as we're seeing, you'd have to keep fighting after that, really, and carry on. Well, well, sadly, and that, that brings a lot of concern to, you know, at the last independence referendum we had, people were putting off buying homes uh, here in Scotland until after September 2014 because they didn't know what was going to happen in Scotland and, and other parts of the UK. The uncertainty for businesses is unacceptable. Now, people throw back, well, well, Brexit, but the uncertainty with Brexit, at least there was an end date and people could see one way or another something was going to happen. With independence and the Scottish National Party, I accept that is their raison d'etre. That is what they believe in. But the country needs to move on. It needs a definitive marker. And 2014, September, the vote that was held democratically, you know, involving people across the country, engaging people at all levels and all ages, was that marker for us. And we should be able to move on from that and focus on the bread and butter issues, the issues that affect people day in, day out in a devolved Scotland where we have more powers than ever before and part of the wider, stronger United Kingdom as well. Given that was a once-in-a-generation vote, will Boris Johnson allow a referendum if the SNP win May's election? Well, the Prime Minister has already written back to Nicola Sturgeon when she had previously uh, yet again requested the powers to hold another referendum. And I think the best way we can stop this constant constitutional argument is to you know, stand up against the SNP. And we do that at the ballot box next May. And people... I know we'll be very aware now that the Scottish Conservatives are the only ones that can stop the SNP and their further arguments and uh, obsession with independence and allow us to get back to the, the, the real task ahead of us, which is taking Scotland forward as a united country. You weren't, weren't part of Operation Arse, were you, uh, Douglas Ross? No, I, 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 I think that was at the conference, wasn't it? And I, I remember reading about it in the, uh, certainly in the, in the press around the time of the Conservative Party conference a couple of years ago. But no, nothing, my hands are clean. I better explain to the to listeners that this is a, an operation from, I suppose, Remain supporting, maybe Remain supporting Tory activists who didn't like Boris Johnson much. I mean, he is called Minister for the Union. That's one of his other titles, isn't it? As well as First Lord of the Treasury. Does that mean anything, do you think? Or is that all just for show? No, I think it does absolutely mean something. This Prime Minister and indeed, um, you know, previous uh, Conservative Prime Ministers uh, are... Uh, so supportive and strong in their belief that the United Kingdom uh, is uh, a great country as four nations coming together, working together, achieving more together. And Boris Johnson, Theresa May, David Cameron uh, and all the Conservative Prime Ministers before them uh, have been Conservative and Unionist to their heart. Uh, and I think that this Prime Minister gets that um, and he will fight every day to protect and preserve the Union of the United Kingdom. Surely there should be some form of ad campaign from the Westminster government. I mean, almost all stamping things that are paid for with English taxpayers' money, bridges and whatever, with the union flag. I mean, that, that happens to aid money now, doesn't it? U UK aid is stamped with a union jack in the same way. And bridges, of course, paid for by the European Union, had a little logo on there with, 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 with the European Union flag. Sh shouldn't we start stamping kit that we pay for in England with the union flag to try and show how important the union is. 
Well, it's not English taxpayers' money. It's uh, taxpayers across the United Kingdom. Okay, money fair enough. Is, yeah. is spent in every, Apologies. It's spent in every part of the United Kingdom. But yes, I think we should be, you know, uh, unashamed of our investment in Scotland. And that investment we've seen through the COVID pandemic, billions of pounds supporting local economies here in the country. The VAT reduction to 5% is as welcome tourism and hospitality of companies course. in Shetland as they are in South Cornwall. All those things are UK government investment in Scotland, but sometimes there's not uh, the understanding or the visual connection between that money and the UK government. And I think, yes, we should be unashamed of our direct investment in communities across Scotland. We'll see that through the Share Prosperity Fund. That's the money that the EU used to earmark to projects in Scotland and other parts of the UK. If they could have the EU flag on it, why not have the, the United Kingdom flag on it to show that the here is an example of our two governments in Scotland working together and the UK government delivering for individual communities and projects the length and breadth of the country. Now, if it's just about you, quickly, Douglas Ross, you're a dad, you've got a child, it's fantastic. You're also a SPL referee, you're an elite referee. What are your thoughts about footballers breaking lockdown? We saw that happening, didn't we, with that individual at Celtic and, the, and a few players from Aberdeen uh, in the past two weeks. Yeah, I think it's just been unacceptable. They uh, signed agreements that said they are elite sportsmen and they were in a very privileged position to come back to work to to allow them to play football. And it was a great uh, moment in Scotland when we got football back. Yes, the fans still can't get into the stadiums and it's very different in the games I've already officiated. But the fact it was there, we could focus on it on a, a weekend or midweek games that we've had uh, was great. And I know fans welcomed any form of football coming back. And then for that to be put under threat by the actions of a small minority of players was simply not on. And we've seen the backlash and I can understand the frustrations from fans of, of these clubs and Scottish football in general because the vast majority of players, clubs and officials across Scotland are following the guidance to an absolute T because they know they have to and the actions of this small minority uh, put the return of the game under threat and it's not on. Yeah, the SNP regularly have a go at you about your other job as a ref. Um, what have you learnt from running the line and refereeing matches about politics? Well, first of all, the SNP have had a go at me for my uh, refereeing for years and every election that they've raised it here uh, locally in Murray that I can't be a councillor and a referee, I can't be an MSP and a referee, I can't be an MP uh, and a referee, then every time I've been re-elected. So the people of Murray have made their view on the, the kind of party political points that the SNP try to put across. But in terms of, of what have I learned, first of all, the refereeing for Eternity in Scotland and I know across the UK and the world, you know, we work very closely together as a team. You've got to trust each other on the pitch because you are effectively the third team. So it's really good for teamwork. It's really good at, in terms of making instant decisions that you've got to know are credible and you've got to be able to back up. And in some cases, making unpopular decisions that you know are correct. And you've also got to have a bit of a, a thick skin. So I think all those things in refereeing are also very appropriate to, to being a political leader, particularly here in Scotland. You've run the line, I understand, for seven old firm derbies between Celtic and Rangers. What's the worst abuse you've ever had? Well, it probably wasn't at an old firm derby. I have done seven. And, and the one thing about an old firm derby is just the wall of noise throughout the, the 90 minutes of play and indeed in, in the whole of the build up. You can't hear very much. So probably more of the abuse I've actually been able to hear and pick up on is when I do local amateur matches here in Murray and, and people remind me, you know, of, of big decisions I've got wrong on the TV and how could I even consider going to Royal Royalsville Park and doing a, a Forest and Nairn welfare match because you hear that, that personal criticism far more than you hear when, you know, Hamden, Ibrox or Celtic Park right, are full with 60 odd thousand spectators. Yeah. Why do you think you're relatable? I've been ringing around friends of mine who are concerned about the Tories in Scotland. With Ruth Davidson, she'd always hop onto a, a cow and ride, a, you know, anything. She was up for any, any kind of policy stunt and she certainly appeared to be talking from the heart. Well, why are you relatable to ordinary Scots? Yeah, well, I, I'm up for that as well. You know, I'm not saying there's a buffalo going to pass my window right now that, that I'm going to jump on. But, uh, you know, I, I come from, you know, a very humble background. My dad was a, a farm worker and when he lost his job uh, quite late on in life, he, he then had to uh, find alternative employment. He became a, a groundsman with the, the local council here. Uh, my mum's a, a dinner lady, so you know, I wasn't 
what some people wrongly view the Conservatives as, you know, you've got to be born into, you know, a very privileged position. Um, so I've worked hard and, and my family's worked hard. I've got a young family myself and I think this positive message I'm going to take to people across Scotland over the next nine months really has to look at what we can do for, for the current generation and future generations. And also just, just on football, you know, people will criticise me for it. They say I, I shouldn't be running the line anymore, but it's it's our national game. And, you know, a huge number of people here in Scotland follow football. So maybe it won't win me any votes because I'll have uh, done something wrong to their, their team. But people can at least relate to the fact that, you know, my outside interest from politics is something that they also enjoy. OK, now before we wind up here, Douglas Ross, we've got some quick fire questions. OK, I'm worried about this. I've got in trouble before with, with quick fire questions. You've got to answer there. You can't dodge them. OK. Here we go. Leave or remain? Leave. Rangers or Celtic? <laughs> Absolute dodge, that one. <laughs> in or out of the union? That's easy for you. In. Lunch with Boris Johnson or dinner with Ruth Davidson? Uh, we'd have afternoon tea with them both. Oh, stop it. Haggis or Cornish pasty? Haggis. Lovely. Deep fried Mars bar, delicacy or disgusting? Uh, unique. <laughs> VAR in Scottish football, for or against? For. Bring it on. We need it. Bring it on. Milk, first in tea or last? Last. As a former dairyman, that's important to me. Just finally, Chopper's Politics or BBC's Newscast? Uh, Chopper's Politics every time. (laughs) Well, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much, Douglas Ross. And we'll be doing more from Scotland on this podcast running into May's election. But we do appreciate it. Have a great summer. Thank you. Well, that's all for today. If you've enjoyed this show, tell your friends about it, tell your mates, your mother, your milkman, pass the podcast on. And please do leave us a five-star rating and maybe even a short review on Apple Podcasts. It helps boost our podcast up the charts and really helps other people know we exist. Thank you again to my guest this week, Douglas Ross. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells and Edith Lampitt, and my editor, Theo Ludis. You can read all of our best Scottish coverage, including our expert analysis from our team on the ground, completely free of charge for 30 days by taking out a trial Telegraph subscription. Just go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. And if you want to get in touch, as ever, email me. The address is chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or follow us on Twitter at chopperspodcast. Now I'm taking a short break from the podcast for a couple of weeks when our US editor Ben Riley Smith will be taking over and taking this podcast across the pond to assess the state of American politics and November's all-important presidential election. But that's all for me this week. Please always, always buy your copy of the Daily Telegraph. Until next time, cheerio!